Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say I, I want to personally thank uh, Secretary Albright, Ambassador Galbraith, and General Wes Clark and Ron Brownstein for a great panel this morning. I thought they did a terrific job, and I hope you did as well. Uh, we're going to talk now about the Dayton Peace Accords, what's happened 15 years later, and where Bosnia and the region go now. Something Dick Holbrook used to say all the time was that Dayton was far from a perfect peace, but the choice in November of 1995 was between an imperfect peace and continued slaughter. And we did everything we could to convince the parties to choose peace. We knew at the time that it was just a beginning. And I want to say a, a few words about what we did. But I'd like to begin by placing the, the last question Ron Brownstein asked is relevant to what this panel is going to discuss. The last question that they were asked to deal with is, was the model used to bring about <clears throat> the peace agreement, the work that the United States did, is it a good model for the challenges we face today since, relatively speaking, there are, it's a more multipolar world? And so, again, to go back to what I said in, in the beginning a little bit, I was quite well aware that from the moment the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union began to break up and Russia was then quite weak economically, as I said, that my very first international effort was to organize a $24 billion aid package for Russia. China was rising, but nowhere near the level of economic or military capacity it has today. Same with India. It had begun its <clears throat> economic reform very recently, only in 1991. <clears throat> and Ron Brown had identified as Commerce Secretary other rising countries that he believed would shape the 21st century, would create this multipolar world in ways we hadn't imagined. And we decided we had to focus on them, both to try to build good relationships with them, to keep bad things from happening, to help good things happen. He identified Mexico and Brazil and the United States. We had a major economic crisis in Mexico, and twice I moved to put together major aid packages to help Brazil. That's almost inconceivable now. The Brazilian economy is so strong, but they were at serious risk there. He identified, uh, you won't be surprised, that Nigeria and South Africa in Africa. And the South Africa seems to be on a better path now, but a lot of their economic and political resurgence was derailed by the AIDS crisis. And um, Nigeria has a special set of challenges we all know. Both of them occupied a lot of my time when I was president. He identified Poland and Ukraine in Europe, and Poland's done pretty well, but we all know that the Ukrainians have claimed their democracy and then had a terrible economic time and are now in the process of redefining themselves. We identified Indonesia and Korea and Asia, and we had a big change away from dictatorship in Indonesia and then ended their ethnic and religious conflict manifest in uh, East Timor becoming the first new nation of the 21st century. Uh, and bridging it all, Turkey. So I guess what I want to say is I thought this was a good model because I was perfectly well aware that it was a fleeting moment in history when America would be the only military, political, and economic superpower. And I used to t 
say to our security team all the time, you know, it, China and India have more people than we do, so it's just a matter of time till they generate more wealth. And if the Europeans keep coming together politically and economically, they will have more people than we do, and many of them already have a higher average income than the United States. Once someone has as much money as you do, then whether you're the only economic, um, political, or excuse me, political or economic superpower is more up to them than to you. That is, when the Chinese decided to build a new submarine fleet of diesel-powered submarines, then they go faster, deeper, quieter than our nuclear fleet. So to me, in addition to the humanitarian and regional and European implications of Bosnia, this was about trying to find a way to put a decision-making process in place that would create a more unified world, that would have the forces of integration overcome the forces of disintegration in a world when the United States was no longer the biggest dog on the block, or the only big dog on the block. I wanted to create a world that I'd like for uh, my generation's children and grandchildren to live in when we could no longer dominate but had to lead. And what has really changed is two things. One is there is a m more competition for influence and power, and it's the wealth and capacity are more widely dispersed. Also, frankly, our economic weakness had made it more difficult for us to be taken as seriously as we otherwise would be over the long term. And one of the things that distressed me most about the last election was the framework in which it unfolded. That is, we once again got stuck in a time warp of saying this election is about who wants more government and who wants more less, who wants more government spending and who wants more tax cuts. That's a silly thing. There's not a single successful country on planet Earth that does not have both a vigorous and successful private sector and an effective government. The real choice is what do we have to do to create the future and are we more committed to making the changes that will create a future that gives us the economic strength to exercise political and military strength or are we so caught up in what we have now, whether it's we, somebody at my income group who wants to hold on to my tax cut, or we, uh, somebody in the a public or private sector group that wants to hold on to some other benefit, the cost of which is outweighed by the future diminishment uh, for our children and grandchildren. So I set that up to say what we tried to do after Dayton was to recognize its limitation. And the most important thing with the most tragic results, of course, was the great uh, trade mission that uh, Ron Brown and Chuck Meisner and Doris, thank you for being here today, and all the others from the Commerce Department and the business community took because we knew we had to create a new economy for the Balkans. So that is the background. What is the Balkan equivalent of what we did with the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Group, which has been expanded with the leaders? What's the equivalent of the expansion of NATO? What is the equivalent of the Summit of the Americas, which we rekindled for the first time in a quarter century and now meets every four years? Is there a, a unifying, systematic contribution the United States can make, and what do they have to do on their own to make all the sacrifices of the people who actually gave their lives for this endeavor and the efforts that the United States and the Europeans have made worth it? Uh, this is going to be a very good panel, and um, so I want to bring them out. The first is we are deeply honored to have Baroness Catherine Ashton, who is the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Affairs. That's a fancy way of saying she's the Secretary of State of Europe, <laughs> and a very impressive one at that. I thank her for coming. Uh, I thank uh, Jim Steinberg, the Deputy Secretary of State, for coming, and uh, given all the challenges that they're facing at the State Department today and 
he's probably glad to have a, an excused absence, but I, want, I have already personally thanked the Secretary of State for allowing him to come. Um, I want to um, acknowledge uh, the presence, even though she was claimed to be absence, of Christiana Manpour. And I, I wanted to say uh, one thing about, I, I admire her very much, but the unshirted hell she gave me in the first two years I was president about not marching the entire American army into Sarajevo, and I'm only slightly overstating it, was a gift. It was a gift. I, it, it, there are sometimes relatively few when you can say a single journalist had a decisive impact on the lives of people and a set of political decisions that followed. But I've already explained to you, you, you saw that the, where popular opinion was, you saw where the Congress was. The Europeans were reluctant to get into this Bosnian imbroglio because they were not sure they could fix it. And believe it or not, there were all sorts of excuses, including the fact that the then French president, Mr. Mitterrand, whom I admired and liked very much, really had a soft spot for the Serbians going back to World War II and their fierce opposition to the Nazis, and he just couldn't believe that they were as bad as we were saying until they were, until the French were double-crossed. And I think, uh, I think, going back to what the previous panel said, I don't think there's any question that the slaughter at Srebrenica and the changing security situation on the ground brought the Europeans to the position that we had been advocating and that Dick Holbrook had been trying to implement with others. But I do think that in creating that climate, Christiana Monfort had a lot to do with it. And I, I thank her for that. Uh, then most important of all, we are joined today by the president of the Republic of Croatia, Ivo Josipovic, who is a lawyer, and this is very important to me, a composer. And uh, it's important because he has to now compose a future for his country and for the region. And finally, the president of the nation at the center of all this, President Bakir Izetbegovic, who is an architect, and he has to build his way out of where we are. <laughs> President Izabegovic uh, obviously was preceded in the leadership by his father, now deceased, who was the person with whom I had the honor to work and whom I had the honor to visit in the hospital not long before he passed away. He was a magnificent person. Uh, this family has played a great price to serve and struggle for the integrity of its country and for its future. So I thank President Izabegovic, I thank President Josipovic, I thank uh, Baroness Ashton, Christiane, and Jim Steinberg, and I'd like for them all to come out now for the second panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and Mr. President, thank you for those wonderful introductions to our distinguished panel and for the very generous words you just spoke. It was, um, as you all know, uh, era-defining war and an era-defining peace. And for those of us who covered it, it was a, uh, a professional and personal defining moment. So I'm delighted to be invited to come back here and talk about the future after having witnessed the present at that time. Um, can I start, actually, with, I just want to uh, start with James Steinberg, who was Deputy National Security Advisor at the time, or, and in the State Department at the time, exactly. 
Um, I'd like to pay just a tribute to Richard Holbrook because Dayton also has Richard Holbrook's name, of course, uh, emblazoned on it. Just to go back, if briefly, if we could, the negotiations that President Clinton brought everybody to, having led the uh, the bombing of the of the targets and having brought it to a point where it could actually have a negotiated peace. It wasn't inevitable, though, when the three leaders went to Dayton and hold themselves up for that many days. It wasn't bound to happen, was it? Thanks, Christian. I think that's right. You know, I mean, it was for anybody who had the, uh, I guess, privilege of, of actually being there and holed up in Dayton for those weeks. Uh, quite an extraordinary uh, moment because on the one hand, you had um, going on on the outside this, this horrible, uh, terrible human tragedy. Uh, and, and in the room, uh, people who were responsible for that. Uh, and trying to find a way uh, to, on the one hand, not lose sight of the enormity of the crimes that were being committed on the outside, and yet the need to deal with these individuals and try to find a way to reach an agreement. And I think there are many encomiums that can be given to Richard, but I think perhaps the most important was that he understood, one, he understood the history of the region and, and the background of the conflicts and didn't see it just as something that happened today or yesterday or even with the fall of uh, communism in Tito, but understood its rich history. He also understood the individuals. He knew them and he knew that they knew each other. And that was one of the extraordinary things about that is that on the one hand, you had this slaughter going on, on the outside. On the other hand, you had three men who'd been part of the political establishment uh, under Tito. And he, he, he used that and played that dynamic uh, to make a difference. And, and just to pivot to the future, um, what was so extraordinary was that when Richard came back in uh, to serve President Obama uh, as the special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, he couldn't let go of the Balkans. And he saw on my schedule one day that I was going to be meeting with Valentin Insko, who was under consideration to be the new high rep, the, the lineal descendant of everything that he had done in Dayton. And he called me up and he said, I'm coming to the meeting. I want to make sure he's good enough to make sure that the work is carried on. And sure enough, he came down, he sat into the meeting, he asked the questions, uh, and he stayed with it. And it was his passion and, and, and his achievement that, uh, that we all ought to pay tribute to. That's a, that's a wonderful anecdote. And of course, none of us can let go of, of the Balkans. None of us can let go of what happened there. And I want to start by asking you, because we, James Steinberg just talked about the slaughter that was going on. And you, President um, Yusipovich, have made reconciliation a hallmark of your time in, the, in office, more than a year now. Why is that, and do you think that's a precondition for still solidifying the peace? There are three dichotomies uh, decisive for future of the area uh, of our neighborhood of Croatia itself. It's uh, confidence and trust versus fear. It's solidarity versus selfishness. And it's partnership versus, versus selfishness. And also it's very important to build uh, common work and confidence between uh, leaders and countries. Uh, but basis for all this is uh, reconciliation. I think it's a very basic process to build all these the other requirements. And uh, from the very beginning of my uh, mandate of my office term, I started to build contact with our neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, with Serbia, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, with Slovenia, Montenegro and the others. And uh, it was not always easy task because uh, there were opposites, opponents to it because the war was really bloody. And I have to stress here and to pay tribute to President Clinton and Dayton process because uh, they really stopped the war and it was the most important thing in the time. And uh, the President Clinton clearly showed the difference between office holder and leader. And he was really a leader. And I think the region now need leaders, not office holders. That means we have to have capacity to see the future. And uh, if I may say, our future is European future. Uh, all countries uh, would like to be member of EU and Croatia is going to be, I hope, very soon. And one of uh, very important strategic things that we are considering is how to help our neighbors, especially Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, to join EU as well. Because uh, this may guarantee for all the region and for Croatia for security and for economy as well. But precondition is reconciliation and trust. Let me ask you, President Izebegovic, then. 
you know, 15 years later to still be talking about reconciliation may, may sound, you know, a little, a little strange. Do you think that reconciliation has happened in Bosnia? Is it solid? You know, at least five things stopped 15 years ago. And it was, as it was said, almo almost nobody lost life in these 15 years. But the, it takes time for proper reconciliation. You, can, you cannot expect you know, Bosnia, half of population expelled from their homes, 100,000 of dead, 100,000 of uh, disabled persons, horrible things happened. It's not easy to solve all those problems in, in 15 years. And it, it, as also it was said, some people, especially in Bosnia, expected too much from Dayton. You cannot make perfect state, you cannot make perfect peace, you can mo not make perfect institution from that situation from that material that you had in that moment in Bosnia. Horrible war, ethnic groups who fighted each other, and then we expect perfect state. But the core, the main and fundamental things is done by Dayton. It is, it is as I said, fundamental, it is a basis for the future, for, 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 for better future, for, for building institutions, for, for reform, so for reconciliation. The, the main thing is, of course, the reconciliation. That, 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 that fear, of the others, that, 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 that uh, you know, Balkan fear from, 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 from future with, with, with different uh, ethnic group, it, it is the main problem. We have Still. to work. Yeah, of course, mm -hmm. of course. But, but it's absolutely much, much better in each sense in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. In each sense, Bosnia is much better. For, for an optimist, as I'm an optimist, it is absolutely clear that glass is more than full and that we passed more than half of our journey towards the, 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 the normal states, it, it is obvious. It, the trend is it's, uh, there. Well, that, that's really encouraging to hear. Um, Lady Ashton, you heard President Yosipovic talking about EU accession. Um, give this audience uh, an idea of the difficulties of actually getting into the EU and why somebody like Croatia is still struggling to get in and what happens to Bosnia and Serbia. I think that the, the first thing I want to say is that I agree that the future for the countries of this part of our world belongs with the European Union. We are currently 27 countries born of the fire of war and the long shadow of the Iron Curtain. We know about conflict, we know about dispute, we know that there is a better opportunity in having people collaborating, working together politically and economically. And I believe the, whether Europe is successful or not depends on how effective we are in the neighborhood uh, around us. And that's a big, big challenge for all of the 27 countries, and I guess especially for me. So against that backdrop, it's important that countries come in able to really take their part and take their place in Europe. So there's a whole load of things that has to happen. Getting the constitution in the right shape, sorting out the legal situation, making sure there is a single market economically. Some of these things are quite painful for business, for uh, countries to go through to be ready, and they take time. And the journey that uh, Croatia's been on has been a long journey, probably feels very long, but you're towards the end of that journey. And the effectiveness of Europe is how well we're able to support those countries to be ready, so that when they do join, they can be fully participating 28, 29, 30 countries sitting around the table, able to act as equals, able to act as partners. Jim, do you think the bar is too high? I mean, if a country like Croatia, Bosnia, I know Serbia's had its issues, I mean, it's 15 years now since Dayton. How long is a reasonable amount of time before being able to get into Europe? Well, I, you know, I think we've learned over the years for the United States, we're not going to judge for the European Union uh, what its standards ought to be. I mean, we obviously want to see the Balkans integrated. Uh, we have a more direct role uh, with respect to NATO, and so let me just say a word about that, which is I think uh, we all share the view that uh, the uh, vocation, the future for the Western Balkans is in these transatlantic structures, and we, we will work hard and keep that door open for the countries to participate. But it's also true and it's something that uh, President Obama has stressed and Secretary Clinton, is that uh, this is not a club. This is a, 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 an alliance which is fighting a war in Afghanistan that has serious security challenges. 
and that we expect, just as we can help provide security by their membership in NATO, they also have to be in a position to contribute. And so the bar is only the bar of making sure that as they come into these institutions that they can contribute and that, that it's not just being done uh, to help them along their course. And I do think this is one of the fundamental challenges that we face because the international community had a great deal of responsibility and the United States took responsibility to help bring an end to the conflict uh, in Bosnia and in the Balkans. And we share a strong commitment to that future and to helping support that future. But at the end of the day, it is the people of Bosnia and the people of the other Balkan states who have to make the decisions that are, say that they're ready to do it. And what we've seen, unfortunately, in Bosnia is even relatively simple decisions, like how to dispose of the state property from the former Yugoslavia so that we can get the military property going has proved a bridge too far. So the door is open. We made an important decision last year to open the door to uh, Bosnia's membership action plan. It's an important step into NATO. We will keep that door open for Bosnia to walk through, but it does require the leadership of the kind that President Izabegovic is offering to make sure that that happens. So, President Izabegovic, what can you do to make that happen faster? You mean NATO? Yeah. We have to solve some, some clear, clear, clear things like, like solving problems of uh, military camps. We, we need to, to give it to, to, to our armed forces and uh, I think we will make it before September because the September is deadline. We, NATO expect us to, to, to solve the problem before uh, September. I'm sure we will make it. Um, what, Lady Ashton, do the BIH, the Bosnia-Herzegovina leadership, what do they need to do to get not just NATO but into the EU? Well, there are a number of very practical things that we're working with them on. For example, you know, what I was saying earlier about the need to be sure that you're able to participate, it's also that your citizens get treated equally across the European Union so that you know the court system works, you know that uh, the way that you're treated is the same. So, for example, there are some very practical things that need to be done in terms of the constitutional court rulings. You've had the European Court of Human Rights that's made rulings about the ability of anybody to be able to stand for election. That's really significant and absolutely at the core values. There are lots of issues around building the economy that need to be dealt with, all of which Europe can help with. But as Jim says, it has to come from the people themselves. We don't impose the European Union. We want to work with countries. They have to want it because it's a long journey and it's tough. But if they want it, we'll work with them to get there. So, President Yusufovic, if you want it enough, you can work with the EU to get there. You hope, I think you hope, that by January 2013, you'll be, you'll, you'll be positively responded to and welcomed with open arms? Yes, it's very, oh, sorry. Yes, it's very realistic to finish our negotiations during this year. What's outstanding for you? Uh, it's very important to uh, resolve uh, re uh, some additional problems we have, especially in judiciary and in economy. And our government is doing the best to resolve those problems. And uh, also we had, and we are leading now, a very important fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. That's very important and that's one of key issues for Croatia. And I think th uh, our results are pretty good. And we have to have uh, continuous in our policy, in our practice. And for you, is very important not only to have good legislation, but have a good practice as well. And we are trying to do our best. So uh, just few chapters are now left uh, open, and we have to close them very soon. Uh, I hope this year, and then we are the very, uh, very near to. to I mean, just uh, this audience may may know a lot more about the details than I do. Mm -hmm. You say judiciary, for instance. What do you have to do to make your judicial system acceptable to European integration? Uh, so we have to shorten uh, duration of our processes. That means we have to adapt our procedural rules. Uh, even a few years ago, we had about two million of unresolved cases. Two million? Two million, yes. <laughs> and now we have annual, annual capacity to, to, to deal with all cases because we have uh, uh, about 700 cases li li living uh, before the courts. Then we have to improve our legislation on election of judges to have impartial and uh, very educated judges and public prosecutors as well. And of course, we have to exclude any possibility of political influence uh, to our judiciary. I think this part of our task is now 
more or less uh, done. Mm -hmm. Um, Jim, the notable by his absence is the leader of the Bosnian Serb Republic. What do they need to do, do you think? I mean, I know it's a different uh, level of, of presidency, but what, what do they need to do, if anything, to make this process solidarity, reconciliation, and, and better integration? You know, it, we could talk about specifics, but I think there's a, there's a deeper underlying challenge here, which is that uh, as President Izabekovic, I think, nicely said, the, the challenge here is to turn the focus away from a focus on fear and worrying about what you might lose to what you can gain by moving forward. And because of the history, because of all the difficulties that he talked about, many of the leaders are unfortunately focused on protecting what they have, of worrying that they'll be taken advantage of if things are changed, and they fail to focus on the benefits that will come not just to them, but more importantly to the people that they represent from moving forward. And so the focus of our efforts, and it's been a strong partnership with the EU, and I'm really grateful to Lady Ashton and all our colleagues in the EU, the United States and the EU working hand in hand, is to try to turn their attention, to, instead of looking backwards, instead of looking at what you might lose. And I think especially uh, for some of the Serb leaders in the Republic of Serbska, there is this sense that we've got to hold on to all this stuff, that, that this is ours, and, and if there's any change, we might lose something. And what we've tried to emphasize is that you won't be at risk going forward, but there's, there's a bigger pie, there are big dividends to be had from this integration, from moving forward, that nobody is trying to fundamentally undo the Dayton compromise, but there are things that can be done which will benefit all of the peoples of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And if we can motivate leaders, and more importantly, motivate the people of Srpska as well as the Federation to see that future and to take the chance to move it forward. Well, let me just see if I can press you a little bit on that because the last time I was there actually was about three years ago. I went with Richard and Kati and we were in um, Banja Luka in the Bosnian Serb uh, heartland and Richard was trying to get, uh, it was Dodik I think, yeah, trying to get him to play ball, trying to get him to, you know, to, to do what Dayton was asking him to do. So how much difficulty is there in that relationship? From your perspective as an American who, who helped forge the Dayton, and from your perspective as the EU commissioner for... Yeah, you know, Christian, when there's, when there's a very concrete benefit to be had, it's surprising how uh, flexible people become. And so on visa liberalization, which Lady Ashton can talk about, which there was a huge public demand for, Bosniaks, Serbs, Croats from Bosnia, Herzegovina, all wanted to travel uh, in Europe, and they passed the necessary reforms to permit uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina to meet the standards for visa liberalization. They knew there was something they had to do, it wasn't easy, but there was a concrete benefit at the other end. And so that's, again, that's the challenge, is to make sure that the, the, the concrete benefits are there, and then there's, there's enough pressure from the ground up on the leaders, even if they are reluctant to do it, to realize that they can't turn around and fo force their voters. Right now, though, uh, in part because the dialogue is not a very positive one, uh, the press is a, an important factor here. It's very factionalized. It tends to focus not on the benefits of moving forward, but the risks of going forward. And so that's why I think the challenge is to keep the spotlight on what's needed. And I think what both of us try to do is when we go to Bosnia, I've been five times, over the last two years, I'll be there in a couple of weeks, is to talk to the people and to keep that front and center so that the leaders understand that there are people watching what they do and the choices that they make. Lady Ashton, what pressure can, can you bring? What can the high representative bring? Because the, the press issue was one that I mean, we, we saw as well 15 years ago and throughout the whole war that the press, the local press, was very antagonistic. I'm, I'm just hoping Jim will stop calling me Lady Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> He calls, he calls me Kathy, which is what everybody calls me, please. <laughs> can't deal with this lady, <laughs> can't deal with it. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think, you know, one of the challenges for Europe, which we have certainly not got right yet, is the visibility in Bosnia, and I would argue even with Croatia, we were not brilliant at this, of actually selling to ordinary people what the benefits of being part of Europe is. Um, I kind of joke that it's true in the European Union as well, 27 countries, but being part of the European Union, and I say this from the country I know best, uh, is not necessarily the flavor of the month or the year or the decade or possibly even the century. And yet there are countries desperate to get in because they see from the outside what the benefit can be. But for many ordinary people in Bosnia-Herzegovina, they don't really know what this would mean for them. Yes, okay, we can talk about an end to 
uh, to conflict, to potential of even greater reconciliation. But actually, it's even more practical than that. And what Jim said about visas is right. The ability to travel, the ability to trade more effectively as a business, to have a huge market of half a billion people to sell your products in without any of the barriers that you would have otherwise. To be part of a trading bloc that's also doing trade deals elsewhere in the world. To be part of the political work that goes on across Europe that actually for ordinary people on everyday basis can make a difference. So one of the things I've got to do is work out how to be more effective on the ground in actually putting forward the proposition that Europe means a better future for all of the people there, better jobs, better opportunities. And if we can do that, we can make a big difference. So President Izet Begovic, there's always been rumblings uh, for, for years uh, that the constitution of Dayton should be changed or amended. That certainly the Bosniaks uh, felt that perhaps there need to be some tweaks given uh, the, the realities of how it was done and, and, the, and, and, and now. Is that still something that you're trying to push for? Yes, yes, we would like to see the changes of constitution because we think there, there, is, there is in Dayton created too many possibilities of blockades. You know, all, all those ethnic groups were afraid of the others, so, so they, they need some blockade in order not to be uh, ruled by the others. So, but now it's time to remove those, those blockades, like, like entity voting, like, like various kinds, too many of, of breaks. All of us have on disposal too many op opportunities to, to stop the process, to put things stuck. So, so it is something that must be solved. And it's time for OHR to leave Bosnia. But we need domestic mm -hmm. mechanisms. Well, sorry, for what? For, for, for OHR, oh, the high representative of the high office. Representative, yeah. It's time. But if you remove it, if you, if you pull it out, who will do that job? We need domestic ones. And then, as, as I said, I'm an optimist. I'm not uh, op optimistic just, just like that. You know, if you, if you compare the situation 15 years ago, 10, 5, then you will see that we made 60 institutions on, on, on the state level. It couldn't happen if the Serbs were against it. And we had three armies. One of the army was Serb one. We now have unified one army. And three border controls. Now we have one. And three intelligence services. Now we have one. And the growth in economy in Bosnia, in confused and complicated post-war Bosnia, which started not from zero, but, but from below zero. The growth was some 8% per year annually. Growth was 8%? Yes, eight, almost 8%. Mm -hmm. And now salary and pension average one in Bosnia is higher than all Eastern neighboring countries. So it, so it means Bosnia can. How do you and, account and, and for that? And as I said, half of road is... Uh, uh, How do you account for that? What is give, uh, spurring economic growth in how, Bosnia? How we are doing our best. We are working in, 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 the, in that uh, situation. But what do you have? I mean, we, we, we have wood, we have waters, we have rivers, we have lakes, we have minerals. You know, our children are clever, well educated. <laughs> yes, yes, they are. I know yes, that. Yes, That's for are. sure. <laughs> so, children all over yes, the, the, yes. the former Yugoslavia, so highly educated, very so smart, so. wired together, yes. and want to be part of. Of the bigger world, do you they think they shouldn't fight each other? They, they should be engaged in business in sports. There you go, economic yeah, competition. Yeah. Are there elements of Dayton that you think need to be um, renegotiated? The constitution. Obviously, I already paid tribute to to Dayton and its cre creators, but the time is going. That means uh, there are new circumstances, and uh, what President Izetbegovic just told that is uh, need needed to change to be changed. Uh, especially, uh, I think there are two steps. Firstly, uh, the whole three groups must be sure that they're equal in this country, that they can be uh, participating uh, equally in political processes. And secondly, uh, the obstacles for EU and NATO must be uh, lower. Uh, I have to, to stress, uh, I, I heard the, the introductory, uh, Croats, Bosniaks and Serbs are not wild uh, tribes. There are three nations with uh, very important culture, uh, many important people even in world history are from that area. Like remember Tesla mm -hmm. or Meštrović, his monument is here before the U UN. So, uh, and the, when we enter the history, when we look at it, uh, our uh, 
collective memory is much more oriented to common life than to war. And that is the basis for the optimism. And uh, not only uh, goodwill or, or capability of the fathers of the Dayton, but capability of people to live together made Dayton successful. And that is a very, very important message. Jim, yeah, you wanted to jump in there. Thanks. First, let me say to Kathy, we Americans are very t uh, taken with titles, so we just can't. <laughs> uh, I think it's title envy. Um, the, uh, the, we spent a lot of time talking about constitutional reform, and, and uh, together, the US and the EU tried to look at some of the ideas that might move constitutional reform forward. And there's no doubt that there are things that, that without fundamentally changing the structure of Dayton that would allow uh, functionality. Uh, it's a word I know President Yosefovich uses a lot. President Yosefovich uses a lot to focus on functionality. But the, the big difficulty that I see is that right now, as uh, uh, President Yosefovich said, people look to the Constitution and the structures to protect their interests rather than building a political culture of trust. And if the whole sense of we can only move forward by building in these very elaborate and rigid institutions is the only way to protect your interest, it will be very difficult to get that functionality. At heart, what's needed is to build political trust among the constituent nations of Bosnia, Herzegovina, among the political leaders and the like, so that they can reach political understandings rather than constitutional and legal understandings that allow them to go forward. If they recognize that people won't exploit the other because they might lose the next election and they'll be on the other side of it, and they develop a political culture that allows them to work forward, then these constitutional issues will be easier to deal with. But conversely, without some political modus vivendi and working together, they're gonna keep recurring to these technical, legal, and rigid solutions which fundamentally make it difficult for Bosnia and Herzegovina to move forward. Uh, President Izebevich was talking about, you know, the multi-layers of authority and the, you know, several armies and several immigrations and all that, which have, a lot of them you say are now streamlined. But there, there are a lot of different layers, aren't there? I mean, the ordinary person has a really hard time trying to figure out who's in charge, what line is, is what. I mean, is, does that need to be simplified as the years go it's, on in the it's, future? It partially it's getting the res where does the responsibility lie sorted out, but partially it's dealing with the problems of checks and balances. We obviously in the United States understand the fundamental constitutional value of checks and balances between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches. But in, in Bosnia Herzegovina, you have a separate set of checks and balances among the constituent elements. And the combination of the two makes it very difficult to take decisions, to make these very practical decisions which can benefit everybody. And again, I don't want to overstress the problems. As President Yitzhak said, we have made some progress in some of these areas. But there needs to be a, a, an approach to confidence building that doesn't depend solely on formal institutions. Right, but you know, confidence building, we've been reporting now for 15 years since Dayton. What actually would it take do you think, to, to get at the heart of the nub of what seems to be a bit of a paralyzing situation? I'd love to hear our colleagues yeah. talk about that yeah. because they're the ones who are in the front yeah, lines yeah. of this. What would it take? Because it is, you know, it, it is a little bit too much, isn't it? Yes, it's a complicated system in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It works somehow, but some things should be removed, simplified, and so like, on. Like what? Give me an uh, example. Well, let's say in Bosnia we have 10 cantons, each of them had, had its own constitution. Right. So there is 100 ministers, 180, 180 in small Bosnia of ministers. There are so many things to be to be talk about big government to be simplified. <laughs> simplified. It's big confusion. It's big confusion. But it works somehow. Then we are going forward. Now, now we have to simplify that system to to have domestic instead of OHR, you know, uh, mechanisms and and such things and those blockades like entity votes. It, we must, must have, let's say, some so-called European clause, which will reduce possibilities to stop the laws. And then we need, finally, Serbs should be ready to accept one country. They still have that ambiguous, ambiguous attitude, sending, uh, you know, two faces, messages, ambiguous messages. They have to, to, to understand it, finally. Finally, there, there is Bosnia, and there is, their future is there. We have to improve it. We have to accelerate our road towards Euro European Union and towards uh, the NATO, 
and to do good things because in this moment 25% of youngsters are without job in our life. And that's what I was going to get to next. How big a challenge is the economy and the joblessness uh, in, in Croatia right now? What do you think can be done to, to improve that? Of course, uh, we have important economical problems, not probably so deep as uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but we have to develop our international cooperation. And I think cooperation between neighboring countries, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, is very important because uh, former Yugoslavia had different markets and common enterprises having quite good results, not only in Europe, but in Africa, Asia, and the other. After the dissolution of former Yugoslavia, uh, we lost the market. And uh, every single country is not always capable to go back to those markets. And our complementary economy can do this. And uh, now we, it, it's time to think globally. It's time to think uh, about um, common market in the Europe, but also to, to have some common efforts to conquer, co to conquer uh, uh, different markets in Asia, in Africa, even in Europe as well. So uh, this cooperation, economic co uh, cooperation, is a uh, really challenge and opportunity for all countries. And uh, now, uh, every day, I have phone calls or I have messages or emails from different uh, people from, from uh, economy, from Croatia, uh, asking me, President, go and make our relations with Bosnia and Serbia better. It's very important for us. And I think it's the goal acceptable for all countries and all people. So since the two presidents are, are sitting here, how good are your relations in terms of economy? <laughs> two, two of us. And can you make them better now? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Can, can we make it? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> so I would say, I would say in front of us, to normalize the situation is, uh, as uh, President Clinton says, I'm an engineer, so I will say it in that vocabulary. Three ways of buildings. First, this building of trust, reconciliation, and my gratitude to, to Dr. Josipovic who started. Because on Balkans it is easier to follow the same mantra, you know, everybody is guilty but your side. President Josipovic was ready to confess not only to accuse. So he's the one who opened the, the new dimension in that sense. And then after that, it, it will produce better atmosphere. It will attract investments. It, it will encourage businessmen and, and, and foreign investments coming into region. Cooperation within region. Then building of uh, institutions in accordance with, with the European standards. This is the second uh, uh, thing that should be built and rebuilt. And finally, building of infrastructure we cannot become a member of European Union with such infrastructure, especially Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro. We must build it, and it is, it is a way to employ the, the industry, the constructive industry, and to employ, engage, you know, all, all those uh, enterprises which can build. And without such infrastructure, you cannot develop uh, the economy. So three fields of building. It, it is my opinion. Uh, if I may stress, uh, very soon in April, we are going to have a donor uh, economical conference in Dubrovnik, uh, organized by America, United States of America, and I'm uh, also inviting the presidents and ministers of all countries in the region. And uh, that shows that uh, our markets are too small to attract really important investors. And uh, the interest for this conference is very, uh, very high, and I hope President Clinton will also join us because he was one of uh, people that inspired ourselves to organize this type of conference. Uh, also, I have to stress that uh, what was said by President Izebegovic about infrastructure is also very important. Infrastructure highway through Bosnia and Herzegovina connected to Croatia, River Sava that connects mm -hmm. Croatia, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina is also very important. So uh, all this region can be uh, really, really motivated, economically motivated by building uh, infrastructure, not only highways, but the other, other sorts of communication.
relevance as well. If I could ask Jim and Lady Ashton, what is it then that's um, stop? I mean, look, Croatia has fantastic tourism, so does Montenegro, so does Slovenia. I mean, it's slightly a different case, Slovenia. What is it that is sort of holding back that investment into, into this part of the world? Well, you've got a, you've got a number of... of uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was an investor, just come. <laughs> I think the, the biggest thing that you have to have, which we've seen uh, in Croatia, we've seen in other countries, and I think we, we will to see more of uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, is political will. For business to invest, you need political will combined with the rule of law and a sense that there is certainty for investment. And that's true anywhere, from the United States to part of the European Union to anywhere. Business will go where it can see real opportunity, but it's not going to put down roots if it doesn't have the certainty of a market, a certainty that there's a good investment opportunity, and knowing that the rule of law will be there to support it if things get difficult. And that's why for everything that Europe does, it's what we focus on. It's why we think this is so important. But you have to have, above everything, political will to make the changes that will take you to the point where you can really get that investment. I completely agree with that. And, and one of the things that's important in achieving it is in addition to the national efforts, which are extremely important in strengthening prosecutors, courts, police, is the cooperation within the region. And one of the things that's very important that is happening is we're now starting to see regional cooperation. So interior ministers are meeting among all the countries of the Western Balkans. Police authorities are meeting. Because these, these, the criminal syndicates, the corruption, is, is a problem that's too big for most of these small countries which have very limited capacity themselves. And so here's a case where sub-regional cooperation with then the support of the United States and the EU can make a huge difference. And here's a place where I, I think especially Croatia and Slovenia have shown real leadership of bringing together the others, of convening ministers and working level people, judges, prosecutors, to try to get a hold of this. Because the weakest states, Kosovo, Montenegro, Albania, are particularly at risk here. And, and Bosnia and all can use the support of the countries that are further along the road that President Josipovic has been talking about. Do you want to if I may add, uh, very recently we had the opinion that criminals are cooperating much better than states. <laughs> and now, uh, it's completely different. We have special agreements among uh, countries in the region how to prosecute uh, organized crime, uh, especially mafia. And also there is a very significant and relatively good cooperation in prosecuting war crimes, which was uh, it is a miracle after all this history we had. And uh, I think the rule of law is being uh, involved little by little in the whole area on the same level and same capacity. Can I ask you from your point of view, uh, from, from Europe's point of view, how successful are these countries doing, uh, being in terms of uh, not being a mafioso organized crime economy? I think they're doing extremely well in trying to tackle it. It's not just a problem by the way that they have. It's a problem that countries face uh, across the European Union and across the world. The critical uh, thing that I think we, we are would look to is the collaboration that's now enabling some of the best policing and the best knowledge and efforts in how to tackle organized crime, drug trafficking and so on, is being able to be used across the region. And that sharing of information, which is absolutely critical mm -hmm. to working out where the gangs are and how they operate, they, are, they operate like a business quite often. I mean, they're very successful. To be able to smash that, you need to have that sharing of information and that collaboration. That gets better and better, and I think is a real tribute to the work that's going on in the region. Possibly one of the, one of the most pressing problems around the world is unemployment. You see it in the United States, and you see it even greater in many countries around the world. How bad is the situation in Europe, and particularly how does the former, Bos the former Yugoslav republics contribute to unemployment? Well, I, I hate to say a country contributes to unemployment. <laughs> um, I think what we've got across the European Union is some very challenging times, and I don't have to tell this audience uh, about them, but you know that the economic situation in parts of Europe has been very tough. The strength of the Eurozone is beginning to show, 
and the capacity of Europe to find its way through these problems by sticking together and being very clear and very firm about that, uh, that collaboration and the desire for economic growth is beginning to show, the work of the European Commission, and so on. Real plans, uh, a real sense of movement now, I think, uh, beginning to be really part of, of the European Union's progress. But it's not easy. And I think for the countries who don't have the stability built in to their economy and don't have, in a sense, the capacity to be able to, to use the resources they've already laid down, it's much tougher. It's true for some uh, newer member states of the European Union. One tiny example is that the economy of Romania went from plus 7% three years ago to minus 7% in 15 months, hugely based on agriculture, real problems for them to grapple with. And they didn't have the long-term underpinning that some of the older member states did. So we're very conscious that it's different in different parts of, of Europe more broadly. And I think one of the reasons why it's so essential to try, try and plan now for this European future, European Union future, is that we've got more tools and instruments available to help mm -hmm. and to help countries survive and move forward and develop their economy. Jim, would you say that the speed at which Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina are going is, this, is what we should expect? Is it slower than should be expected in a post-conflict reality? Is it faster? Is it about normal? I don't know what normal is, but I think we would like to see, especially in Bosnia, uh, for the effort to go faster. I think we haven't seen the kind of progress that we want. The direction is the right one, but it's not going at the speed that will allow and, and assure the people of Bosnia that they'll be able to be in the same ranks as Croatia, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we've seen, even as you look at the, the evolution of Montenegro, for example, which has been able to, to take some of the tough decisions. Now, granted, the, the, the situation there is not as complex, but there were hurdles to overcome. And, and I think it's not to point fingers. It's simply because I think especially Americans, but also Europeans, wish so much for the people of Bosnia, wish that, that they will be able to enjoy the same kind of benefits and fruits that the other countries of the Western Balkans are getting, Slovenia, Croatia, who have moved into the mainstream, who are getting those benefits, that, that we can't be satisfied with the progress. Today. That's why we're there so often. That's why we're so engaged is because we feel a sense of shared destiny with the people there, and we want more for them. So you didn't want to point fingers, but, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I might. I might. <laughs> President Izet Begovic is sitting right here. What would you ask him to do as a first thing to try to move this uh, process forward along the lines you've been discussing? You know, that what we would ask is what we ask of all the leaders, which is try to find a way to move forward together. Understand each other's concerns, but try to find a way in which you keep the, the interests of the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina in the forefront and, and think about the future. Think about the fact that the gains, the compromise is always hard and, and there, you will always be criticized for those compromises, but that try to point out the benefits and lead. We heard that conversation earlier, as the president said. It's not about holding office, it's about leading. It's a, the reason you hold office, the reason you're in office is not for yourself, but it's for the people that you're trying to serve and to keep that perspective in mind. We don't have a specific set of answers or specific things that you must do this or you can't do that. It's more just to encourage the sense of, of common and shared destiny to come to the room, to be in the room together and to try to find a way when they walk out of the room with some kind of agreement rather than just retrenched into the positions that you came in with. And if you ha you've talked about having to move forward in the, uh, along the lines Jim's talking about, if you had to choose one thing that you think would be critical to move forward right now, what would you do? What we need, what we need is, of course, better atmosphere, dialogue and uh, the atmosphere which will attract, which will right, en right. encourage. How, how can that happen? We've, we've said this several I, times I, now. I, how? I, I, I told you, I'm expecting Serb side politicians from Banja Luka finally to accept unified Bosnia and Herzegovina and common future. This is something what, what is out of my control. I'm doing my best, sending messages, you know. I'm, I'm doing my best, uh, but it is up to them. Let's say, here, I'm here today, but my chief of cabinet is in Belgrade, asking Tadic to come to, on business forum in Sarajevo. Because last year, we had business forum in Sarajevo on 6th April. Muslims came. It means Turks, uh, Arabs, and our friends. I would like now to make it regional one. 
to, to see people from, from Croatia, businessmen, from, from, from Serbia, from Russia, from mm -hmm. USA. We are going in Maryland in, in March. We are going in, in, in Dubrovnik on the 4th April. In, in, in Sarajevo, we have on the 6th April business forum. I invite all of them. Then we, we have to protect investors from slow administration. They are too slow. All those procedures, mm -hmm. we, we have to accelerate it to protect them from organized crime. It is not so sharp problem in Bosnia. There are not some big sharks. The big sharks are in prison, but it's not so 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 <laughs> big big problem in Bosnia. We we succeed to put them there, in their place. So so it is not so sharp problem. We have we have to make atmosphere to invite and start. We have resources, as I said. We have wood. We have coal. We have minerals. We have water. We we can make dams. We can you know our rivers are so strong in Bosnia Herzegovina. So we can make electricity and all those things. Can I uh, go back to something you mentioned, Jim, at the beginning, the whole idea of NATO and the European military commitment. The Secretary General of NATO just spoke very strongly about Europe's commitment uh, and, and said Europe needs to stop being naive about how it needs to keep contributing militarily to, to, to areas of, of theater and not just think it can do humanitarian uh, work and leave the rest the hard fighting to the United States. How big uh, an issue is that for you right now for the US? I actually uh, think, Chris John, that uh, following the Lisbon summit uh, last December, that there's a strong sense of solidarity uh, in NATO. And I, and I give a lot of uh, credit to our European partners because we don't have any illusions about where the European publics are and the skepticisms they have about this. But, uh, but there is strong commitment, uh, a way forward together, both in terms of the political and the military strategy, and I have to say that this is a place where our partners in the Balkans have played a role, uh, that in Slovenia, in Croatia, in Bosnia, which is uh, offering troops for Afghanistan. This is, this is the kind of thing that we look for in a partner, and we have seen the countries of the Western Balkans showing that they have the will and the determination and the understanding that part of being a NATO is to take the common mission and to share the burden and the responsibility for mm -hmm. it. Lady Ashton, clearly um, Mr. Rasmussen thought there was a problem, otherwise he wouldn't have made this rather harsh speech. What can Europe do to contribute more to, to, the, to the military situation whenever there is one, rather than just think it can leave the war fighting and the hard military jobs to the United States and think that it can do just humanitarian development work? Well, I, I don't think Europe thinks that, and I think Anders Rasmussen, who's a a friend of mine and somebody I meet every month to talk about EU-NATO collaboration. I think he has a job of worrying about defence commitments. That's what he, uh, he has to do. And, of course, looking at the issues of finance across the European Union. I understand why he wants to raise the concern. Having said that, I don't think Europe would see itself as being the kind of soft end of the, of the spectrum and leaving the hard stuff. Uh, just to the USA, far from it. But what was really interesting that came out of the, the NATO summit was the new strategic concept, where a core part of that is this collaboration with the EU and NATO, which I'm responsible for from the EU side. And our commitment is to be working side by side with NATO on what often are problems and issues that, that need a full spectrum of answers. If you take Afghanistan, where individual member states are there with troops, where the EU is there supporting David Petraeus and his work, and I see him regularly too, to support the training of police, to do development work on the ground and so on. And I've indicated that the European Union will be working in Afghanistan for years and years to come, because long after the military campaigns, there will be the continuous work that needs to go on. And with Secretary Clinton, she and I met with the women of Afghanistan last time I was there to talk about their future too. So it's a collaboration but it's a collaboration across the full spectrum. And where the EU can bring benefit is also in having that additional support to back up the military campaign with the other things you need to provide real security for people on the ground. Can I just throw a devil's advocate question? Given the fact that the United States has, uh, you know, it obviously does a lot in terms of development, but it's quite shy about doing that. I mean, compared to the war fighting, what would be wrong with the US doing the war fighting and leaving that grubby, unsexy job of development and nation building. Look, the US can't say nation building, it's a dirty word. So why not lead it to, leave it to Europe? 
Um, first, I, I don't agree on the first part because if you look at the, the financial commitments that we've made on the development I know, side, I acknowledge and, that. And, and I, I acknowledge that. And I that. actually, I think you've seen a real evolution in the United States, even in the previous administration, where all of a sudden the nation building word wasn't taboo anymore. And I think we've come to recognize that this is fundamental, that, that crisis prevention, post-conflict stabilization are at the core of what we do. And if you read the, uh, the so-called QDDR, the Quadrennial uh, Diplomacy and uh, Development Review that Secretary Clinton has just masterminded for us, it really sh starts a very dramatic commitment over the long term for our, uh, increasing our capacity and the preeminence that we attach to development as well as diplomacy as part of the 3D, defense development, and diplomacy strategy, that's our whole of government strategy. So I think we unashamedly embrace that and it would be a disaster for the United States only to see ourselves as the pointy end of the spear and not involved in these things. But similarly, if we allow our fate to get decoupled and, and, and where uh, American young men and women are dying and, and not sharing that burden, uh, when we have a common interest with the European allies, the alliance is over. And that has been at the heart of what has kept solidarity forever and it would, I could think of nothing worse for transatlantic relations than to have that kind of division of labor. So do you think that, I mean, I know you've just said this, the partnership is very strong, but are you concerned uh, that, that Europe might, because of the budget cuts, because of all that's going on there right now, contribute less than you'd like? Uh, we, we understand the fiscal realities that European governments face. It is important that, there, that people recognize that it's a shared responsibility and a shared commitment that we can't have free riding, that we can't have taking advantage of this. And I think it's right to discuss these issues. And Secretary Gates discusses this with his colleagues. Uh, I think one of the things that we have felt for some time, and I'd be interested in Kathy's view on this, is whether we need to get finance ministers into this conversation as well as defense ministers. Because what ends up happening is that the defense ministers, of course, all agree. But we need to get a sense in which the, the whole of government commitments are to these things. So it's an issue. It's always going to be an issue when there's uh, the kind of uh, economic pressure. And I think it is important to keep focused on this issue. But I think we've seen, uh, even as European governments grapple with this, that there's a sincere effort to try to find a way forward. We had a very good dialogue, for example, with our colleagues in the UK about how they were thinking about reductions, if they had to make them, to make sure that they were thoughtful, that they didn't undermine alliance commitments, that they complemented what others were doing. There are ways that countries can work together better. So we've seen between Britain and France, for example, better cooperation, thinking about ways of avoiding duplication. We have to be smart about this, and we do have to not lose sight of the common uh, obligation. Did you, did you want to? Otherwise, I'm... Well, just yeah. one, one comment on it, because I, one of the many jobs I have is to chair the defense ministers as well as the development ministers. And I think it's really important that one of the effects of the, the thing called the Lisbon Treaty, which created my job, is the opportunity to collaborate better in Europe on defense issues. And that's led to some bilateral agreements like the UK-France initiative, but also some much broader initiatives about how do we use resources in a smarter way. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that it's not just about looking at the, the money. It's actually saying, what is it that we actually want to do? What do we think our role should be? And how do we do that? And all of those conversations go on transatlantically because it's so important to get that right. Mm -hmm. So Croatia is a new member of uh, NATO and we are participating in different operations. But what's very important to stress that NATO is not only military, it's political organization. And uh, if political goals are acceptable for member countries, then military participation will be better and higher. Croatia is participating in Afghanistan among the other operations. And now there is side effect for Croatia and for region as well. Now we are organizing together with some neighboring countries uh, common forces uh, to participate in Afghanistan. And that's very important because it's uh, in the same time participating in NATO goals and in our regional uh, goals as well. So NATO is for us a very important instrument and we are going to support membership of Bosnia and Herzegovina as much as possible. We are one minute left to our time. I give you the final word. When you tell me how you want to wrap up what we've just said today. <laughs> I was going to say, when do you hope to be in the EU? But I, I didn't when do you hope to be in the EU? I hope, I hope in this decade. In this I hope decade. They, they will make some, some tailored made program for us, something that take in account specific interests, specific circumstances in, in Bosnia. You know something, Bosnia is 
place where we have to prove that nations and religions and various groups can live together. So it is, it is not important only because of us. It, it, something, something special should be done to finish, to make happy and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Th this is my message. <coughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And one moment. Yes. And President Clinton is going to come up and, and wrap up this wonderful couple of panels. Thank you. Well, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I think we should give our panelists another hand. I think they were great. Uh, <clears throat> I want to make one point, uh, sort of coming out of the theme that was this panel began with and that the other panel ended with. I actually do believe that the agreement that we made uh, at Dayton and how we came to it, including the eventual use of uh, military uh, force briefly in Bosnia, sort of set a template for how we would deal with other challenges and crises and opportunities throughout the administration's eight years. And I think the interplay of conflict in the region really is a microcosm of what was going on in the world in the 1990s and continues today. Basically, the world grows ever more interdependent in ways that are both positive and negative. If you look around this room today, uh, I saw students, I bet during the break, from 30 different countries most of whom have never been to Bosnia, most of whose parents would, unless they had university degrees in a relevant subject, would not have been able to find the Balkans on a map. It is a metaphor for the positive aspects of the interdependent world. The fact that we know and feel some identity with all those people asking for personal and political liberty in the streets in Egypt is a metaphor for that. I think it's also quite obvious what the negative implications of the interdependent world are. And I thought from the beginning that the post-Cold War world would be in a constant race between those who were trying to build the positives and reduce the negatives and those on the other side and that we had to find a way to work together that would bring about shared benefits, shared responsibilities, and a shared sense of community. Now, we did the best we could at Dayton, but I think you heard them in the beginning here. The principal defect of the Dayton Accords is that it sought to protect the legitimate distinct interests of the various ethnic groups and their accumulated and understandable fears by giving them all veto power over each other. And I think we got better at that as we went along. Compare Dayton, for example, to the uh, Irish peace agreement, where the parties themselves had come a very long way before, that's the other thing. Keep in mind, these people made this peace. They quit fighting, they quit killing each other, and boom, they were immediately asked to make an agreement. There was no kind of letdown, readjustment time. In the Irish case, where they'd been carrying on for 30 years, the people got out ahead of the politicians and they told them to stop. And the politicians decided to stop. And they created, instead of a negative sense of shared and authority, a positive one. That is, instead of giving each other veto power over the other, they created an agreement of majority rule, minority rights, 
shared political decision making, shared economic benefits, and a shared relation with both their uh, near neighbors, if you will, the United Kingdom, of which the Northern Ireland is still a part, and the Irish Republic. So what we, we all need to do is to try to help them overcome the, the sort of built-in uh, veto bias that President Izabegovich talked about. And you see they're doing quite a good job on their own, but they're just two. And the rest of us have to help. I see this all the time in other ways. There are other places in the world where the political system has a bias in favor of stopping rather than empowering people to share the future together. I mean, I saw one more poll this last week just taken in Israel showing that 65% of the Israelis, including over 60% of the members of the Likud party, would support uh, a peace agreement which had a Palestinian state on the West Bank land swaps to take account of the Israeli settlements, an international oversight of the holy sites uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. You know, basically what we all know it would have to be. But the way the political system works, for reasons having nothing to do with this, it's hard to produce a government that reflects that 65%. So you see this all around the world. Interestingly enough, the country that has gone the furthest to try to stop anything like this from happening is as now was harshly criticized last year during its election season for doing so, Rwanda. In Rwanda, where there was a, an actually a conclusive military action by the now president, Paul Kagame, who then had a dominant role in setting up a new constitution and a new system, because he was in the minority ethnic group, the Tutsis, who were the principal victims of the Rwandan genocide, he, I thought quite intelligently, refused to be the first president of post-genocide Rwanda. He said a Hutu should do it. And then he's then since been in for about 14 years. But they are so allergic to what they went through, their, their Bosnia, their Kosovo, that it is illegal to run for office on ethnic issues and to even talk about the distinct claims of people based on their ethnic backgrounds. And indeed, one lady came home and was subject to arrest and not allowed to run for president because she wanted to run on a platform that said that the Hutu majority also had some legitimate ethnically defined grievances. Now, Kagame's very popular there in part because once they got off the ethnic onto their common future, they went from a per capita income of $268 in 1998 to about $1,100 in 2010, quadruple their income. So the larger principle is unexceptional, and that's why these two presidents talked about all the positive things they talked about. But surely there has to be a way in places where either nobody's prepared to do what Rwanda has done, or where people want to be able to recognize both their separateness and their participation in a larger community. They want to, it's interesting because the Rwandans do acknowledge their history. They have a gripping Holocaust museum and they talk about it, they just say they have made it impossible to repeat it. And maybe they have, maybe they haven't. But my instinct is that what the Irish tried to do, or even what the Lebanese tried to do, which I think would work if the, everybody else would leave them alone. But the, Lebanon has a very complicated religious, ethnic, cultural landscape in which the Sunni Muslims get the prime ministership and the, uh, a Shia is the speaker of the house and then a Christian is the president. They allocate this and that's the way they share power, but they tried to create a system in which it's in your interest to get something done instead of your interest to veto. We need to try to help that happen in the Balkans, either in law or in fact. Second point I'd like to make is that we spend all our time here 
talking about what governments can do, and I think that's important. But I also think that I should take uh, some vow to my current life in, as an NGO. I think one of the most important things we can do, particularly in the European uh, context, is to try to help build civil society and build non-governmental contacts that will create a context in which leaders like these two can succeed, in which a Serbian president could take the lead in trying to promote reconciliation, in which a Bosnian Serb could survive politically doing the decent thing and saying, let's figure out how to share the future together. And so uh, I, I wanted to say that I think that, at least for me, we want to try to do more to help build civil society to help that. Somebody else in my family has all the influence and power now. <laughs> so uh, as a lot of you know, I have this global initiative that meets at the opening of the UN every year, and we've had now about $63 billion worth of commitments in the last six years. We have our first 2011 commitment. A city year, our nation's largest youth service, community service organization, a big affiliate of AmeriCorps, with the support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, has agreed to host a delegation of community, civic, and youth leaders from Bosnia and connect them with counterparts in the United States to share models and approaches for doing citizen service, engaging citizenry, supporting political reform and economic advancement. And they are coming here to do that. And I think that's really important. I think we have to help build a supportive civil society for doing positive things. Because one of the things that I have learned, I see it happen in America over and over again. If you organize the politics in a certain way, even if the people don't feel that way, all the research shows that the people in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the people in Croatia, the people in Serbia, think that their past ethnic fights are of almost no importance compared to their sense of having to create a bright economic future, a bright uh, educational opportunities for their children to build a kind of modern future represented by the young people in this room today. So I'm going to do what I can to help them with this city year project, and I urge all of you to think about what you can do. Uh, finally, let me just say on the discussion that Kathy and Jim were having about the role of the United Na States and, uh, and what Christiane said. We have the biggest consensus we've ever had within the American government for raising the role of soft power, diplomacy, development across the whole government. It is recognized as important to our national security by Bob Gates, who has been wonderful. The, the only time in my experience I can remember a defense secretary consistently advocating for a bigger development budget for the State Department, because he believes it. We have seen uh, in President Obama's administration the, the, the economic agencies all recognizing that this is central to America's ability to increase exports and increase our economic standing in the world to do this kind of investment. And we have made almost no progress in Congress. And in fact, the last election signals a big move the other way. I mean, Madeleine Albright and Sandy and I were just talking about how we're worried about how to preserve the development budget we have. Why is that? That, again, is an irony of democratic politics. If you took a poll and you asked the American people, it hasn't changed in 30 years, how much of our uh, budget we should spend on development assistance, they would say between 3 and 5 percent, no more. Well, how much do you think we spend? Oh, 10 or 15 percent, too much. What is the fact? We spend 1 percent or less. And no matter how many times we say it, it doesn't register. And so even though Every member of the United States Congress knows that they can safely vote for a good foreign assistance budget. They also know 
that they will never be defeated for voting against one. So for all of you who are Americans, I ask you to think about that. When it, you want to sustain the effort in Afghanistan, I agree with much of what Peter Galbraith said about our needing a partner, but uh, we have to prove our good faith that we're not just interested in doing what happened to them in the 1980s when we were only too happy to dance with them until the Soviet Union left and then we left. And the only way you can stay after a war is over is to help people build a better future for their kids. And there is almost no support now in the House. You could say all you want to about the current economic climate. All the, the whole discretionary spending budget of government is only 15% of the total. All the costs driving the deficit are in health care and defense, mostly just in health care. And we should not do this. We should not back away from our responsibilities to Bosnia, to Croatia, to the Balkans, to the future. But we need your help, all of you, in saying that to the members of the Congress and saying, making sure that the American people know that we don't spend nearly as much as they think. They actually have it exactly right. We should spend about 3% of our budget instead of the 1% we do spend. But they think we spend 10, so we're hosed consistently on this. <laughs> Final thing I want to say is this. The Balkans are both a hopeful and a cautionary tale of the modern world. Everyone needs a sense of identity. We need to be able to define ourselves in boxes which enable us to feel tangible and to draw distinctions. Man, woman, white, black, African, Latin American, Asian, old, young, oh. student, teacher, like we, our whole minds work to categorize a blurred reality into categories. And then humanity repeatedly gets in trouble when the categories become more important than the underlying humanity. All this genome research, you know, shows we're 99.5% the same. And the Balkans were a searing experience for me because here were people who were biologically indistinguishable who were of different religious faiths and cultural traditions because of an accident of history where the Ottoman Empire stopped, where the Holy Roman Empire stopped, where the Slavic Empire stopped. And all of a sudden, that was all that mattered. It mattered so much that people could kill each other and have no regard for whether their children lived or died. And so I, I think that that's at the, at the root of all the problems everywhere else that lead to violence. Many years ago, I read a book, and a few years ago, by Robert Wright, who's most famous for having written The Moral Animal which was about our impulse to be ethical in relation to one another. He wrote a book called Non-Zero. And it was, take, that's a phrase from game theory. A non-zero sum game is one where you can win without someone else losing. And we Americans love zero sum games. That's the Super Bowl. <laughs> or, uh, you know, that basketball will make them play uh, seven, eight, 10, 12 overtimes, whatever. There has to be a loser in order for there to be a winner. It's nice for sports, but in the world we're living in, we need more non-zero sum games. And the truth is that the reason that we admired what these two presidents said is, whether we were conscious of it or not is, they have had enough life experience and they have seen enough people die and they have learned enough that they believe they can share the future and the only way they can win is if it is a non-zero-sum game. That is the test that will now face Sudan as they try to deal with the aftermath of the election. It is the test that faces people everywhere. So in a larger sense, I think the Balkans will always be relevant and Dayton will always be relevant because it was the post-Cold War 
world's first brave effort to prove that we can live in an environment in which we can all win. I still hope we make it, and I still think we have to prove it. Thank you very much.